going to uh, speak about a handful of the uh, loyalists who were in some way uh, involved or touched by the Battle of Bennington. Uh, it's not a comprehensive presentation of every man who was present. Uh, that would be well outside the scope of, uh, of the talk we were looking to give today. But I, it's my hope that in presenting a few of these uh, vignettes or uh, uh, very short biographies, that I'll be able to paint a broader picture for you of uh, the sort of men who are involved um, and what drove them and what motivated them. Now, before we begin, um, there are some definitions uh, that should be clarified. Here we have a few of the, uh, the terms that were applied to loyalists. Um, for their part, they would have self-applied the term loyalist, but there were, there were other words used. Uh, they might be referred to as guides, uh, associated loyalists, uh, provincials, friends of the government, um, king's friends, or uh, somewhat of a loaded term, Tories. Now, there is a distinction being drawn at this time between Whigs and Tories. Um, the terms go back to political factions in Parliament, the Parliament of uh, Great Britain, uh, during the 17th century. Um, Tories were monarchists, uh, while Whigs were supporters of a constitutional monarchy, a limited monarchy, and champions of parliamentary authority. Um, Tories' re-entry into politics um, occurred after an extended period of Whig supremacy under George III. Um, as I said, as I mentioned, loyalists never self-applied the term, and in fact, many of them would have uh, considered themselves to be standing up for the rights um, under the unwritten English Constitution. Uh, that Englishmen everywhere enjoyed uh, by supporting uh, the king in the uh, American War of Independence. So, uh, as we'll see, Patriot courts um, could imprison loyalists without clear charges, um, pass judgments without a trial by jury, as well as seize their property. Um, and so, in the minds of a great many loyalists, what was seen by Patriots or Whigs as necessary steps to ensure the success of the revolution uh, could also be seen from the loyalist perspective as abuses and oversteps um, by overzealous uh, rebels. Um, I'd like to discuss uh, a little bit about the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the sources that one may consult when uh, conducting research into loyalists. Um, as you can imagine, history, you know, as the old saying goes, is often written by the victor. And there is, generally speaking, uh, quite a bit more documentation um, relating to patriots and their struggle during the Revolutionary War than there is loyalists, and that is especially true in the United States. Um, however, in Canada, if you get to the Canadian Ar uh, National Archives, uh, as you can imagine, there's quite, quite a bit more. However, um, there are some documents uh, that you can consult directly in order to uh, get some idea of uh, what life was like for loyalists during the war. Um, the first uh, useful uh, compendium uh, was gathered after the war. Well, really, it began, began early on in 1783 and persisted up until 1812 under a couple different auspices. Um, first, the American Loyalists Claim Commission, and then later, uh, the American Claims Commission. And this was a uh, governing body that basically took uh, testimony um, gathered documents and evaluated the claims of loyalists after the war uh, for their losses for the purposes of compensation. 
So in reading these documents, um, two things are generally always included. First, the uh, nature of uh, their holdings in the United States and the colonies, um, as well as their uh, contributions during the war. Now, these documents aren't always uh, fleshed out. Um, they're very often rather skeletal. Um, they'll mention a battle, they may not necessarily go into great detail on it, but they are useful in, uh, in determining exactly what each, uh, each loyalist was, uh, was doing and what they lost as a result of their actions. Uh, muster rolls are also useful for determining who was where and when. And uh, just as patriots took muster rolls, so did loyalists. Um, in fact, as you'll see as we go through a, certain, a few of our case studies here, uh, the muster rolls were of singular importance to a lot of the uh, loyalist officers because in completing their companies, um, basically their pay and their commissions would be uh, determined and finalized. So they had an interest in accurate and uh, meticulous record keeping. Um, recently um, released, um, available on, online as well as in a, uh, a, a book that I'll uh, direct you to at the end of uh, my talk today, uh, there was a muster roll released for loyalists who fought at the uh, Battle of Bennington. Um, we also have a muster roll um, taken in December up in Canada um, of some of the men who, after the disaster at the battles of Saratoga, uh, escaped up there. Um, so these two documents taken together uh, can paint a clearer picture of exactly who was there. Um, and there occasionally there in the past there has been some, uh, some questions. Um, additionally, um, you have the uh, papers of Frederick Haldeman, uh, who basically, after the, uh, after the war, uh, well, during and after, he was responsible for assisting uh, loyalists in settling in Canada after they uh, left their homes in uh, New York and Vermont. I'll just speak uh, uh, generally for a little bit here about some of the uh, opinions uh, that were in the air uh, in the lead up and during the uh, revolution. Um, not everyone began the war as a patriot, obviously. Um, some patriots ended the war as loyalists and vice versa. Um, opinions did ebb and flow. Uh, but the responses, uh, especially in the beginning, when uh, the outcome was far from certain, uh, the responses on the, the part of loyalists were pretty interesting. And so here we have a, uh, a loyalist um, making the case against independence, he sort of uh, issues this prophecy that uh, ruthless war will ravage our once happy land, torrents of blood will be spilt, and thousands reduced to beggary and wretchedness. No person breathing has a deeper sense of the present distress of America or not, or would rejoice more to see these removed and our liberties settled on a permanent constitutional foundation. Um, so that's uh, Charles uh, Inglis. He's a prominent loyalist. And he encapsulated the opinion of many at the beginning of the war um, in sort of hoping that it would be possible to strive for a political solution rather than full independence uh, secured through a uh, protracted war. Uh, we can advance to the next slide. Now, was he alone? In this opinion, um, or how many, how many can we uh, safely say shared it? Well, uh, popularly, uh, you have the rule of thirds, and I think in most textbooks from elementary schools to colleges and universities.
uh, you had presented this rule of thirds. Um, and this is sort of taken from a, uh, a misreading, in a way, of uh, some comments that uh, John Adams made. And so here I have them quoted. I should say that full one-third were averse to the revolution, an opposite third gave themselves up to an enthusiastic gratitude to France. The middle third, always averse to war, were rather lukewarm both to England and France. And if you uh, can read the, uh, the attribution at the bottom there, this is a letter written in 1815, um, well after the revolution. He's not speaking of the revolution uh, as much as you know, the, uh, the quasi uh, war with France or the uh, uh, the War of 1812. So he's, uh, the rule of thirds doesn't really hold up um, once it's uh, the foundations of uh, John Adams are, are seen to be uh, shaky. Um, he later wrote, uh, upon the whole, if we allow two thirds of the people who have been with us in the revolution, is not the allowance ample? And so here, he is actually referring to uh, the American War of Independence. And he is claiming that perhaps two-thirds of colonies, the majority, uh, shared uh, the sentiment of Whigs. Um, so more recent uh, scholarly efforts to quantify just who was on board with the, uh, the Patriot Agenda and who considered themselves a, a loyalist. Um, been sort of difficult to pin down as I can see. There weren't people uh, conducting opinion polls, um, so you just have to sort of make an educated guess. Um, Robert Calhoun, uh, one scholar, has recently made the claim that there were perhaps 15 to 20 percent of uh, colonialists who uh, remained loyal to the crown. Um, but exactly what defines a loyalist um, sort of can affect that number. Um, so is it simply harboring opinions friendly to the king? Um, does it involve providing indirect support to uh, loyalists or regular armies? Uh, or does it involve directly contributing to the fight and joining one of the uh, provincial corps? Well, if that's the case, um, you should consider um, that perhaps 19,000 men in the entire uh, length of the colonies were at one time or another uh, under arms fighting for the uh, king. Uh, that's well short of um, some of the other figures that have been sort of postulated. Um, and you have to consider at the time, around 1780, uh, you can say that there were 2.7 million people living in the colonies. Um, if we're dealing with that 20% figure, uh, that would extrapolate to half a million loyalists, and that seems remarkably high. So, if we're sort of making a conservative estimate, really the best <coughs> we can say is we had about 19,000 men fighting for the king, and that after the war, um, perhaps as many as 80,000 fled the country. Um, I, in my mind, that figure is a little more telling. Um, if, there's, if your actions during the war preclude you from making a life among patriots afterwards, um, I would say that would definitively uh, brand you a loyalist. So I would say at a maximum, you might be dealing with, uh, with 80,000. But of course, there were a number of people whose loyalties and proclivities were conditioned. If you have Burgoyne marching through, you might toast to the king's health. Um, if you have General Stark coming through, uh, well, you might find your opinions change. So again, it just sort of gets back to the, the fluid nature of these things. Um, generally speaking, um, we can say that um, those uh, who were directly employed by the Crown were more likely to uh, be loyalists, obviously. 
Um, we can also say that members of the Anglican Church, uh, who found it uh, repugnant to uh, strike out against the uh, nominal head of their faith, um, were generally more likely uh, to be loyalists among uh, you know, religious uh, convictions. Um, you also have a, a class as aspect to these divisions, um, especially locally. Um, and uh, basically you have powerful landowners um, such as the Rensselaers, Schuyler, Livingston, um, sort of attaching themselves to the Whig cause, perhaps as a way of getting ahead of any, uh, any class tensions that might arise with their uh, tenant farmers. Um, you also have uh, tensions between the state of New York and obviously those living in the uh, New Hampshire land grants, I will later become Vermont. Um, generally speaking, um, especially in the immediate area around the, uh, the battlefield that we'll get into, um, folks living on the New York side of the border, Yorkers, tended to be Whigs, whereas Vermonters um, were much more likely to be Patriots. Or pardon me. Um, New Yorkers tend to be loyalists, the Montreux tend to be patri patriots, because the Crown had uh, stood behind uh, New York's claims to a lot of the land that was being uh, settled, or not so much settled, but sold under New York patents. Um, you also have, finally, uh, the importance of honor. Um, a lot of loyalists you know, perhaps could have been argued over to the, uh, the Patriot cause, but they, given the sort of honor, the, uh, the ideas of honor in the society at the time, uh, the idea of taking the arms against the established government uh, simply didn't appeal to them. Um, and the, the final reason that comes up, that's been brought up by several authors, is uh, perhaps my favorite, uh, and simply, why not? Um, it is almost, it's more in line with the status quo. Uh, it's a little more conservative to remain uh, a loyalist, to remain in the British Empire. And so it's possible just the force of habit. And, you know, here we have uh, some statistics that have been suggested, uh, just summarized visually. Um, you have the nice even split of the rule of thirds. You have Calhoun's 20% um, figure. Uh, and then you have just the simple figures of who fought. Um, if you'd like to advance. So there are some patterns that we're going to see time and again in the stories I'll share today. Um, it's not a universal formula to their experiences, but just given, um, given the common responses on the parts of the uh, committees of safety in the various states, you can draw some, some generalizations. Uh, generally speaking, in the story of a loyalist, uh, you begin with their refusal to take part in revolutionary activities, or the suspicion of neighbors that they are in some way less uh, fervent in their support of revolutionary activities. So they're identified, uh, people speak out against them, and then they're summoned before a committee of safety that has taken over the, uh, the function of royal government. And they're offered, well, first of all, evidence is evaluated uh, against them, testimony is taken. If they are found to uh, refuse an oath of loyalty, they're likely to face some form of punishment. Um, that punishment did vary. Um, they could simply be shunned from their community uh, on a sort of informal basis. Uh, they could face fines. They could face imprisonment. Uh, perhaps most severely, um, they could be named under an act of danger. And uh, in that case, all of their land and property, uh, property would be confiscated and they may run the risk of being uh, even sentenced to 
death in absentia um, by some of these committees. Um, so a variety of punishments, but generally speaking, you can say that if you were a vocal uh, supporter of the crown, uh, you would face some sort of consequences. Uh, so very often, the next step for the loyalists was to flee their home. Um, often they write in their uh, journals or in their memorials to the uh, Claims Commission of a time spent in the wilderness. Uh, they'll mention the hardships that their family, if they have one, suffers as they were gone. And then very often, um, as a result of the actions of these uh, Patriot Committees, uh, they're driven into the arms of any local uh, British commanders. Um, of course, after the war, we knew how things uh, end up. Uh, they find themselves on the wrong side of history. Uh, they'll generally make some sort of attempt to settle their affairs in the United States. Um, if they're able to uh, return for any important papers, they do that. Um, if they've somehow managed to have someone hold on to their land or their farm in their absence, uh, they may sell it to that individual um, if it hasn't been seized. And then they go about the business of appealing to the Crown uh, for compensation for their losses. And that was almost universally a uh, rather harrowing experience. As you can imagine, there were quite a number of loyalists. You know, we quoted that figure of 80,000. If all of a sudden you have 80,000 people applying for compensation, for their life savings, uh, property holdings, and work. Uh, that's a, a hefty figure, so the government would very often argue that number down on the basis of documentation, or simply deny it outright. We'll begin uh, to get into the Battle of Bennington now. Uh, so here we have a uh, little information uh, pertaining to the, uh, the campaign. Now, the Battle of Bennington occurs with context of the uh, Saratoga campaign. Uh, the Saratoga campaign is very often portrayed in popular histories as uh, you know, solely being uh, General Burgoyne's brainchild. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, a number of commanders and government ministers had uh, been working to put the plan together. And in fact, it was the, uh, the plan uh, the previous year to uh, the Battle of Bennington in 76. Um, but of course, it, the uh, advance of Crown forces south out of Canada stalled. Um, so, just to uh, give you an idea of a little bit of the, uh, the context ahead of the battle, as for Moyne, uh, whose task was marching uh, south along the uh, Champlain, uh, Hudson River Valley, uh, advances. Uh, he's met with success after success. Uh, and after he takes Fort Ticonderoga, it appears that the hard work is done. Um, his uh, colleagues in New York City, who are not terribly concerned with their role in the plan, which is to advance north of the Hudson Valley and join his army in Albany, um, they figure, once they hear the news of the uh, capture of Ticonderoga, that the, the most difficult uh, part of the, uh, the operation is over, and they're free to sort of uh, pursue Washington's army and attempt uh, to take Philadelphia. Um, but as we're going advances, uh, he begins to stretch his supply lines, and rather than opting for a much simpler uh, route taken over uh, waterways, he decides he doesn't want to give the appearance of retreat, and he decides to pers uh, pursue an overland route, uh, which really uh, just logistically stretches his resources uh, far too thin. He begins the campaign with too few uh, horses, oxen, carts, uh, other livestock, basic necessities, and as he advances, um, this becomes more and more of an issue. And so we come to uh, the Battle of Bennington. Um, in this context of being sort of overextended and low on certain supplies, uh, he issues an order. He's going to send out a detachment 
under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Baum uh, to procure some of these uh, supplies. Um, here we have a, a direct quote from his orders. He says, the object of your expedition is to try the affections of the country, to disconcert the counsels of the enemy, to mount themselves with dragoons, to complete Peter's Corps, and obtain large supplies of cattle, horses, and carriages. So he's uh, being tasked with a rather ambitious um, job of marching well away from the main army with much fewer men than some of the other, some other commanders have suggested. And he's going to uh, make a sort of round trip of over 200 miles before rejoining the main, uh, main body. Um, and basically, well, we're leaving uh, civilians of some of their property. He's hoping to drum up loyalist support. So those those two objectives would uh, would seem to be at odds. So at the outset, uh, Burgoyne has assumed, as many uh, positions of leadership in the British government and military had assumed, that most of the uh, most of the country would be with them. However, that turns out to uh, not be the case. Um, you have one uh, author, Christopher Moore, pointing out, uh, only if the revolution had been a weak conspiracy without popular support could Burgoyne have succeeded. He was advancing deep into enemy territory. He would receive some support, but a fraction of what he expected. And really, that more than anything uh, would contribute to his defeat especially banked. Uh, along with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Baum, uh, you have provincials. Uh, broadly speaking, um, they're organized, as I've outlined on this uh, slide here, under uh, John Peter's Queen's Loyal Rangers. Uh, you have a, uh, a number of officers. Uh, Justice Sherwood, which we'll discuss at length. Jeremiah French, David Paul. Uh, Simeon Cole, Andrew Palmatier, Francis Holmel, James uh, Pennock, and in Fister's Loyal Volunteers, um, you have Samuel Anderson, Henry Ruder, and John Ruder. Um, I'll also discuss Henry Ruder uh, at some length. So you can uh, advance the slide. Again. All right. So here we have sort of the, uh, the general uh, plan of battle here. This is uh, an engraving, a simplified engraving of a rather well-known map of battle. There are German maps that exist of the Battle of Bennington. Uh, however, this particular map was created by an English engineer. Um, and it's a little difficult to see, but let's walk up. Um, in the key, uh, you have listed uh, C, American Volunteers. And their position is indicated in two places. The first at what's popularly, popularly referred to as the Tory Redoubt. And uh, the second, and sort of uh, what amounted to uh, Baum's rear guard, along with the baggage. Now very often if you're reading uh, second-hand accounts of the battle, the author will place loyalists at one or the other position um, almost interchangeably. Um, but really, you can't make any uh, uh, definitive placements as to who was where uh, without consulting uh, some additional primary sources. All we know is there were loyalist positions here and there were loyalist positions there. Uh, one man who we know was present at the, uh, the Battle of Bennington because we had an account of a uh, Patriot militiaman uh, taking a few pot shots at him. Uh, and of course, he appears in uh, Burgoyne's orders to Tom, um, as well as his personal papers. Uh, we have Philip Skeen. Um, and I begin with him just because he, he's such an interesting character. Um, and he probably bears um, some responsibility for Burgoyne's failure and almost certainly Baum's defeat in the Battle of Bennington. Um, just because the position 
enjoyed as an advisor. So, in uh, Burgoyne's orders to uh, um, he writes that Colonel Skeen will be with you as much as possible in order to assist you with uh, your advance, uh, to help you distinguish good subjects from the bad, to procure the best intelligence of the enemy, and to choose those people who are to bring me the accounts of your progress and success. So, essentially, Philip Skeen is being given this trusted position on the basis of an assumption that he has uh, important insights or some special understanding of the situation on the ground and sentiments in the countryside. Now, Philip Skeen, he was a, uh, a well-established landowner. And as we'll see, he had incentives to sort of convince Crown forces that loyalists probably existed in greater abundance than they did. And and these days we talk about sort of politicians being stuck in a bubble and not being aware of what's going on around them. Well, it's probably safe to say that given his sort of privileged position, the scheme was, was in a bubble. He likely had no idea of the, the extent of uh, the true extent of Patriot Center. So Philip Skeen um, is actually uh, born a Scotsman. Uh, he was born in 1723. And as a young man, he began a career uh, in the British Army. Um, in 1756, he was uh, first sent to America, and he fought the French, um, uh, receiving uh, a wound. Um, so he was an, an experienced soldier. Um, he went on to uh, make a life for himself in the colonies, and that was fairly common. Um, Quite a few men who fought in the British Army uh, would stay behind. Um, they had, you know, cultivated connections uh, as a result of their uh, their service, and so they were able to uh, to utilize those. Um, eventually, uh, Skeen would go on to own uh, some fifty six thousand acres of land uh, in the area around present day Whitehall, uh, which of course was formerly referred to as Skeensboro. Um, which he rented out to tenants, um, many of which were former soldiers. Uh, so he initially settles uh, 30 families on his land, and that is uh, thanks in large part to the support of uh, General Amherst. Um, so at uh, Skeensboro, he, uh, he was fairly prosperous. Um, he continued to attract uh, tenants. Uh, he built a, a mill, a forge, a general store, and a post office. And here you can see sort of a, uh, an artist's engraving of what Skeensboro uh, might have looked like before uh, quite, of those, quite a few of those structures were burned. Um, as the, uh, the revolution broke out, uh, he gravitated towards, uh, towards the loyalist circles. Um, being a uh, prominent member of the local community, he was selected to go to the Continental Congress. And whether he was you know, thrilled with this prospect or not, he was convinced to go because he would be able to inform loyalists about the proceedings there. Um, he was seized in Philadelphia in June of uh, 1775 and was later jailed in Connecticut for a period of months. Uh, just because it became known, you know, where his, uh, his loyalties lay. Um, so, this is sort of the position he finds himself in. Um, he has the, uh, the faith of the British government, but his neighbors are becoming increasingly hostile. So, as uh, General Burgoyne uh, begins his uh, march, he contacts Skeen, and he gives him a uh, key position in his army. He makes him the uh, chief commissary of oaths. Basically, he's put in charge of telling friend from foe. Um, and he also is uh, given the rank of a colonel. Um, so from the very beginning, he's presumed to be this, uh, this valuable source of intelligence. But time and again, you know, he, he, uh, he fails in this capacity. Um, 
Let's see. So before the Battle of Bennington, uh, it's interesting to note that General Stark, in planning his uh, enveloping attacks that ultimately led to uh, victory, uh, he had an excellent idea of uh, Baum's positions and numbers. And this was in large part due to the fact that he had spies able to walk freely through these positions and through Baum's camp. Um, as Skeen is welcoming in loyalists to administer oaths and uh, cards of protection, um, it's safe to assume at least a few of those went right back to Stark and told him exactly what to expect. So, certainly, you know, that, that can have contributed uh, to, uh, to Baum's uh, defense. Um, so, later on in the battle, uh, after the first engagement, Baum is essentially defeated. Uh, the bulk of his forces are either killed or captured. And what does Skeen do? Uh, we know that Skeen isn't taken in the first engagement or, or otherwise injured because he rides to uh, meet the reinforcement column that's coming to Baum's aid um, under the, uh, Brayman's command. And he tells Brayman, the day isn't lost yet. If you march back towards the battlefield, you can save the day. And when he makes, when he gives this advice, he almost certainly knew uh, the position that Baum was in, that it's, he was being overrun. Um, so it's unclear exactly why he told him this was the case, but he convinces Brayman to continue his advance, uh, which proves to be a disaster. Um, so, in 1779, uh, two years after the battle, in uh, a somewhat delayed reaction, uh, much of his property was seized um, by the state of New York. Uh, he and his son uh, were both declared outlaws, and uh, basically his farm is going to end up being sold off. Um, earlier on, I sort of alluded to the fact that most of his buildings, with the exception of his stone house, were burnt. Uh, that was not during the, uh, the Patriot retreat from uh, Ticonderoga, so they, uh, they paid uh, paid him a little visit there. Um, so, the state of New York uh, made a tidy profit on his land, uh, securing 21,000 pounds for uh, the total acreage, uh, which of course greatly assisted them in uh, you know, pursuing the war effort. Um, for Skeen's trouble, you know, keeping in mind the, uh, the price that uh, New Yorkers fetched for his land. Uh, the Crown later awarded him compensation of 1,528 pounds, um, well shy of probably the market value uh, he would have uh, fetched for his land before. Uh, and additionally to that, he was offered uh, 200 pounds per year. Uh, he made some attempts to recover land that was seized. Uh, these were all futile and he died in exile in England in 1810, uh, one imagines uh, rather bitter at the outcome of the revolution. That was uh, John Peters. And John Peters, um, he was born in Connecticut, he was born in Hebron, Connecticut, um, but he did eventually settle in Vermont. So he, this is uh, our first Vermonter as opposed to a, a Scotsman. Uh, he settled, he would go on to settle in Moorestown. But, interestingly, he settled on a New York title, uh, which we'll come to. So as a young man, uh, Peter studied uh, law at Yale. So he was on, you know, sort of the fast track for success. Yale's quite prestigious today. Uh, you know, it's, it was the, uh, the case even then. Uh, his father was also relatively prominent in the uh, community. He was a colonel in the local militia, and his uncle, Samuel Peters, uh, was a reverend, uh, I believe in the Anglican Church. Um, so his father, uh, whatever his political leanings, um, didn't really hold much sway over his son for whatever reason. Um, Peters sort of fell in with his uncle, uh, Uncle Sam, I suppose, 
and uh, became a loyalist. Um, so, in becoming a loyalist, he throws away uh, quite a bit, or in his mind, I suppose, at the time, he would be thinking that he was gambling quite a bit. Uh, he was a colonel of the militia, appointed in 72. He was a justice of the peace. He was a judge of probate. He was a registrar of the county, clerk of the court, and a judge of the court of common pleas. So, had he joined the Patriot side, uh, at the conclusion of the war, it's very likely he would have gone on to, uh, to uh, positions of prominence. However, that doesn't happen. Uh, he finds himself appointed to the Continental Congress, much as Skeen was, um, and again accepts for motivations similar to Skeen's um, on the advice of his loyalist uncle, who sort of wants to keep an eye on what the, uh, the rebels are getting up to, or the malcontents. Uh, later on, he is called before the Committee of Safety in uh, New York State. Um, he's tried, um, and he's found to be guilty of corresponding with Governor Carleton in Canada. Um, so as a result of these findings, he has his property confiscated. Um, he was eventually uh, released after being held by the committee, um, but he was harassed by, uh, by neighbors and uh, friends coming and going to the proceedings. And actually, um, a mob uh, looted his home. Uh, he had a fairly large family. Uh, he had a wife and eight children. Um, they were evicted from their home in January and sent to uh, Fort Ticonderoga um, however, uh, as they're making their way there in a uh, rel relatively harsh winter, uh, a British uh, patrol did come upon them and assisted them in getting to safety. Uh, so, in 1776, he decides, you know, after all these reversals, he's had enough. He's going to do something about it. Uh, so he flees to Canada and serving first under Carleton, uh, he is appointed a colonel of the Queen's Loyal Rangers. Um, and it's interesting to note that within the Queen's Loyal Rangers, there were both uh, men who had settled in uh, what would become Vermont under New York titles, as well as New Hampshire titles. So his job was sort of to, to keep those two factions from uh, uh, coming to blows at times. Uh, he fought, actually, against his own father um, that same year uh, with Carleton. So here we have uh, an excellent illustration of uh, sort of the Civil War aspect of the Revolutionary War uh, that could uh, have a tendency to, to uh, divide families. Uh, very often, because they were familiar with the area, uh, provincials were used and employed as either a uh, vanguard or a rear guard or scouts. And the consequence of this was basically uh, if there were, if uh, Burgoyne entered a battle, he had the Queen's Loyal Rangers uh, present at the head of his army. Um, so they suffered uh, quite a few casualties just as these battles accumulated. Um, well, Peters himself wasn't present at the Battle of Hubbardton. Uh, the Queen's Loyal Rangers, uh, in large part, were, um, and they, uh, they suffered quite a bit there. Um, and this is going to become important to his, uh, his personal fortunes. It's not just a, uh, a tragedy for the, the company. Uh, it does become sort of a, a personal problem for him down the road financially. Now, at the Battle of Bennington, uh, you have every indication that he's positioned at the uh, Tory readout uh, with uh, Pfister, who was basically an overall command of uh, the provincial soldiers fighting at the battle. Uh, it's unlikely that he was uh, present at the, uh, the baggage. Uh, 
sort of what we're basing that on is uh, some of the uh, description of the fighting that Peters himself provides that I've uh, reproduced on this slide here. Um, and so I, I assume uh, for many people who've studied the battle, this will be familiar, but for those who haven't, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting and uh, sort of heart-wrenching account. So he writes, a little before the Royalists gave way, the rebels pushed with a strong party on the front of the Loyalists, which I commanded. As they were coming up, I observed a man fire at me, which I returned. He loaded again as he came up and discharged at me again, crying out, Peters, you damn Tory, I've got you. He rushed on with his bayonet, which entered just below my left breast, but was turned by the bone. By this time I was loaded, and I saw it was a rebel captain, Jeremiah Post by name, and an old playmate and schoolfellow, and a cousin of my wife. Though his bayonet was in my body, I felt regret to destroy him. So, there again you have Peter's uh, life story sort of uh, illustrating the, uh, the idea that the Revolutionary War was really a civil war. Um, Peter's does escape the battle. Uh, his uh, Queen's Loyal Rangers uh, suffer a number of casualties, and we'll get into some of those numbers. But he, do, he does escape, despite his injuries. Um, in the aftermath of the battle, um, we have um, some of the men who served under our next subject here, Justice Sherwood, uh, his company, uh, wanting to join up under the uh, command of uh, the company of uh, Captain Samuel McKay. Um, for whatever reason, they didn't care uh, for Justice Sherwood. I believe it probably had something to do with, again, that New York uh, land-grant tension. Uh, Peters forbids it. He uh, threatens to lock up some of these uh, dissenters, but uh, ultimately, you know, Sherwood is going to also suffer greatly as a result of the aftermath of the battle. Now, after the battle, um, Peters does claim that he had 152 men um, active. However, this seems unlikely, as uh, one author points out, because in two days later, he only has 70 drawing provisions. So it's possible that uh, he lost uh, quite a few men as a result of the, uh, the Battle of Bennington. Uh, the Queen's Loyal Rangers, um, over time, they uh, brought in 643 men, all told. More than enough to complete his regiment or his company, but um, at the time of the battle, they probably had only a little better than 200 or so. Um, so Peters goes on to uh, rejoin uh, Burgoyne, as I mentioned. Um, there's a tension between the uh, with the, the men serving under Justice Sherwood that he has to deal with, um, and then there's defeat. After Saratoga, um, Peter is very cleverly, um, very prudently, gets permission in writing from Burgoyne to uh, depart the main army so as to not be charged with desertion. And he uh, makes his way to Canada. Um, so at this time, after Saratoga, uh, the Queen's Loyal Rangers stand at 62. So they're greatly diminished. Um, and if you ever have the opportunity to uh, look through some of uh, Peter's personal papers, um, he becomes sort of, like many men, obsessed with what he perceives as an injustice uh, done to him by the British government, um, without ever you know, naming it as such. Basically, he never completed his company. Um, even though he did bring in hundreds of men, he never mustered a complete company because due to losses as the campaign wore on, uh, he was never able to, uh, to do so. And so he doesn't receive his commission. And because he doesn't receive his commission, um, as a uh, colonel, he ends up you know, drawing much less uh, uh, money as a result. 
Um, despite the fact that he had ample documentation that he was promised his commission, and despite the word of uh, General Burgoyne himself, that uh, Peters behaved with the greatest spirit and zeal on all occasions, his words, um, he sort of languishes in this uh, bureaucratic limbo attempting to resolve uh, this case. Um, his uncle uh, writes a letter directly to uh, Lord Germain, arguing that uh, since Peters raised perhaps as many as 518 men, he should have been awarded the commission that would have been his when he uh, uh, would have raised 400. Um, another letter in uh, the, uh, Peter's collection um, is influenced by uh, some of the uh, testimony that Burgoyne gives before Parliament. Um, one of the excuses that he offers up for his defeat is that, quote, the provincials were not to be depended upon. Uh, which he qualifies with a few only accepted. Um, Peter seizes on this phrase, trying to convince uh, some of the men in the British government and the Claims Commission that he's one of these few, that he should be accepted, and that his conduct was exemplary. Uh, in 1787, there's a Colonel Kingston waiting papers from America that would have netted Peter's 100 pounds per year. Uh, so about half of what Skeen was, uh, was eventually going to receive. Um, but before they arrived in 1788, um, Peters dies, making his case for restitution in England. So again, he sort of suffers a similar fate. Now we can advance the next slide. And so here's, uh, here's a few snippets from his, uh, his memorial. Uh, he writes that he was uh, often mobbed and once imprisoned by the malcontents. Uh, he was a volunteer with General Carleton on Lake Champlain, where he fought his father. Uh, he was at the Battle of Bennington, where he lost half his corps, most of whom had never been mustered for one of time. And on his return to Saratoga, General Burgoyne thanked him. So these are all sort of the, uh, the positions that he took in his, his arguments, in his, making his case. So I'm going to uh, sort of uh, conclude here by uh, discussing Justice Sherwood, who is a very interesting character. Um, I believe that if he had fought on the uh, Patriot side, he would be probably just about as well known as uh, Ethan or Ira Allen or Seth Warner or other such figures. Uh, but. That's not how, uh, how things uh, came to pass. So Justice Sherwood, um, he was a captain under John Peters in the Queens Oil Rangers, which we just, just discussed. Uh, he was born in uh, 1747 in Connecticut. Um, and he settled in the uh, New Hampshire land grants, becoming involved with the uh, Green Mountain Boys he had purchased his land under a uh, New Hampshire title uh, when he began sort of his activities with the Green Mountain Boys. He uh, was in possession of 100 acres in uh, Sunderland. Um, very quickly, he realized that if uh, he did not defend his property, um, New Yorkers would come in and attempt to evict him. So he fell in with figures uh, like Remember Baker, uh, Ira Allen, and Seth Warner. Um, Governor Tryon actually declared him an outlaw. And his response to that was to uh, buy additional property under a New Hampshire title. Um, he actually was very nearly involved with uh, Ethan Allen and uh, Benedict Arnold's uh, capture of Fort Ticonderoga, he arrived on the scene just a little after uh, their success, and after they procured uh, some of the, uh, the field pieces there, some of the cannon. Um, so he begins to have his doubts in the, uh, the Patriot cause. Um, when Patriots begin to gather militia for an offensive 
into Canada, he decides that it's going, it's going too far. Uh, he's a man who will defend his land and his family and stick up for his neighbors, um, but he has no interest in uh, advancing into uh, one of the, uh, the king's provinces on an offensive. Um, he makes some impolitic remarks at a tavern, uh, makes his opinion known, and very soon he finds himself uh, falling into favor with the uh, Patriots, especially uh, his former uh, Green Mountain Boy colleagues. Um, so as, as a result, uh, his home is raided in much the same way that Skeens and Peters was raided. Um, and interestingly, he is uh, sentenced to life imprisonment in the Simsbury Mines, sort of this deep, dark, uh, terrible confinement, um, just on the suspicion of being a spy for Governor Carleton. So he uh, fled to uh, Crown Point. He uh, joins up with uh, some of the British uh, forces in Canada. He winters there. Uh, he joins Carleton's expedition. Um, for 41 days, he uh, actually serves as a scout. Um, later on, he's placed under, uh, as a captain under Peters, and uh, he uh, brings in 40 men with him. He only needs 60 to uh, complete his company, so he's, he's well on his way. Um, he's present in uh, the vanguard for most battles, again, with the exception of Hubberton. And we know by July 12th, uh, he's gathered 46 men, so he is having some success as a recruiter. Uh, on the eve of the Battle of Bennington, uh, he was tasked with Burgoyne with uh, connecting, meeting up with Baum's forces, uh, with supplies and recruits uh, that he would have gathered uh, from the area. Um, some sources actually uh, refer to a Tory officer tipping off Burgoyne about the uh, uh, supply depot in Bennington. Um, there's no direct link um, between Sherwood and this uh, anonymous, at least to us, source, but it's, it's very possible, as some authors point out, that he might have been the one to provide this intelligence that ultimately drew Baum uh, toward Bennington. Um, now, some historians, <laughs> going the other way, uh, they raised uh, the question in the past of whether or not he's actually even present at this battle. Um, there is some, some controversy, some question. Um, he's, uh, he, the accounts he gives aren't consistent between each other, and some of the facts he provides are contradictory with others that are, are known to be true, but generally speaking, uh, I believe the consensus is you can safely say he was president of the Battle of Bennington, and certainly he claimed as much himself. Um, again, he's uh, praised by uh, General Burgoyne as, uh, as someone whose conduct was exemplary. Um, later on, he does uh, claim to have been taken prisoner after Saratoga, but there are other documents that place him in Canada at the time when uh, prisoners from Saratoga were being held in Boston. So, whether he was in Boston or Canada, there is a little discrepancy there. Um, as I pointed out, many of the men in his company left him after the battle. Um, they'd suffered uh, grievous losses, and one suspects there might have been some personal animosity between them uh, and their commander. Um, so, at the uh, Battle of Freeman's Farm, uh, He's supposed to have been injured. His wife, somehow receiving this news, um, applied to the uh, Council of Safety in Bennington for uh, passage or safe conduct to go, uh, go and see him at Fort Ticonderoga, um, where she gave birth to a child. And it's interesting that they named the child after his uh, command. Uh, his name Levius Peters Sherwood. Uh, Carlton later uh, would get him uh, 30 pounds a year um, as, a, as compensation for his efforts. Um, but 
like many others, all his property was confiscated, uh, with the only exception being a, a small tract in New Haven. For whatever reason, that was uh, left untouched. Um, in June of 1778, um, he was allowed finally to break parole. Um, he wasn't uh, he wasn't supposed to uh, take up arms against uh, any patriots as a part of the uh, convention, but um, the Crown forces maintained that Americans had broken it, so they released all these provincials uh, back into active service. Um, he returns to Vermont, and this is where he uh, becomes sort of this uh, this very interesting, like, heroic, uh, sort of cloak and dagger figure, almost. Um, on his return to Vermont, uh, he begins to uh, guide fleeing loyalists back to, uh, back behind the British lines. And he starts to lead raiding parties into Vermont. And he starts, after displaying his, his skill in all these matters, um, he's given a little bit more authority uh, he's actually put in charge of prisoner exchange negotiations. Um, so already his commanders are sort of recognizing him as, a, as a, someone who's very uh, talented. Uh, so he's made the commissioner of prisoners and the commissioner for refugees. Um, and, and again, somewhat of a delayed reaction. I guess the wheels of justice turn slowly. In 1779, he's banished from Vermont. Um, so, in addition to his work as a uh, sort of provocateur and negotiator, um, he actually sort of enters uh, the political stage, in a way, um, because he has this network of spies, um, he had, he's uniquely situated to sort of serve as a point of communication between uh, the British forces and the Patriot government in Vermont. So he's actually involved in negotiations, uh, begin to convince Vermonters to break away and join, uh, rejoin the British Empire. So this time, they're sort of going their own way. They suspect that the uh, Congress will not grant them the uh, statehood that they desire. Uh, so, for, for a time, they're receptive to these offers. Uh, nothing is ever set in stone, nothing is ever agreed to, but it is, it is alluring to have their, some form of their independence recognized uh, by an outside of government. Um, his own his own uh, description of some of his fellow Vermonters um, sort of calls into question, uh, you know, just how highly he thought of them. Um, he writes things uh, where he suggests uh, buying the leaders of a delusional people. He believes that he can bribe some of the uh, Vermont leaders in government uh, to bring them over to the crown side. Uh, however, this isn't going to succeed. Uh, generally speaking, again, we don't have opinion polls, but you can safely say um, those who weren't ardent patriots, uh, they were likely uh, neutral. They probably uh, favored a position of neutrality. Um, so as he's conducting these negotiations, it's interesting that he's still under order of banishment. So if at any point, uh, they decided they wanted to enforce this, <laughs> he could have been arrested or perhaps executed as he's conducting these negotiations. So he does take some personal risk in doing all this. Uh, later on in the war, uh, he constructs a blockhouse on Lake Champlain. Um, and out of that, he sort of stages uh, some of these raids, uh, conducts the operations of his uh, circle of spies, uh, as well as, you know, providing care to loyalist refugees. Um, towards the end of the war, especially after the, uh, the Battle of Yorktown, and as 1783 approached, uh, 
uh, his blockhouse sort of takes on the character of a trading post. So people are coming in, they're sort of wheeling and dealing. Um, and you know, some semblance of uh, normalcy is you know, they try to reestablish. Um, in his memorial, uh, Justice Sherwood claims 2,980 acres total that covered multiple townships. So that's quite a holding. Um, they don't uh, award him nearly as much as he requests. He asks for 1,200 pounds in compensation, he gets 600, um, cutting things in half. That was <laughs> fairly standard as far as their uh, claims commission goes. Um, later on, he becomes a very, a very important figure in Ontario. Um, he is involved in surveying uh, townships in Canada. Um, and uh, interestingly, he comes into conflict with an old friend uh, from the land grants, a uh, Judge Monroe, who uh, got into an argument with Seth Warner, and who uh, Warner and Sherwood basically assaulted, uh, eventually came over to the Loyalist side, and the two of these, uh, two of these guys end up sort of uh, butting heads as Sherwood advances into a position of a prominence. Uh, he becomes justice of the peace, he becomes a land commissioner. Um, interestingly, he brings uh, some slaves up in, uh, to Canada with him, and they're uh, instrumental in uh, reestablishing his family. Uh, he becomes the captain of a local militia in this new settlement, and as a result, he receives 3,000 acres, so much the exact, almost the exact figure uh, that was confiscated. Um, so again, he has this promise in life ahead of him. Uh, in contrast to Skeen and Peters, uh, it looks like he's going to do all right. Uh, but tragedy strikes, and in uh, 1798, uh, he falls off a boat and drowns. So his, uh, his life is cut short. Um, so, I do have other profiles, which I'll omit just in the interest of brevity here. Uh, but before I conclude, I would just like to share a few sources with you, a few titles uh, for further reading. If anyone is interested in any of these figures or learning about what they did during and after the war, uh, there's a number of uh, resources you can consult. Uh, 